Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 12th meeting of 2019. Before we move on to the first item in the agenda, can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones or put them on silent as they may affect the broadcasting system. So on to the first item in the agenda. It's for the committee to consider whether to take item three today uh, in consideration of evidence taken in relation to EU exit future meetings in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Right, now on to uh, the second item on our agenda is for the committee to take evidence on EU exit and the environment, focusing on waste and on chemicals. We're going to take evidence from two panels, and we have the first panel with us just now, focused on waste, and I'm delighted to welcome our panel this morning. Good morning. Linda Ovens, Director of NTEC Solutions and uh, Centre Councillor Chartered Institution of Waste Management Scotland. Good morning. Libby Peak, the Senior Policy Advisor, Resource Stewardship, easy for me to say, the Green Alliance. Good morning. Stephen Freeland, a Policy Advisor and Coordinator for the Scottish Environmental Services Association. Good morning. Rebecca Walker, um, Head of Function Materials for Scottish Environment Protection Agency. Good morning to you. And Ian Gulland, the Chief Executive Officer of Zero Waste Scotland. So good morning to you all. Um, I think I'm going to ask... A, I suppose a, a quite a broad question and, and just indicate to me whether or not you want to come in and, and give your view on it. I guess it's what are the key risks to the waste sector uh, of EU exit of whatever flavour, I, I guess. Um, is, it, is it worth, firstly, um, obviously waste exports is um, a big issue for us. Uh, but is it maybe worth firstly clarifying what we mean by waste export? Because uh, there's two types of waste that we, we export from Scotland and, and the UK as a whole. Um, you've got recyclable waste and you've got non-recyclable waste, which is largely defined as RDF, which is a fuel for uh, continental incineration plants. So the biggest exposure for Brexit it falls on the, the RDF exports. Whereas our, our recyclable waste generally goes um, be, uh, outside of the EU, goes to the Far East. So at, at worst, it transits through Europe where there might be some issues around border control. But we don't, most of our waste is not exported to Europe, it's exported outside of Europe to the Far East. So um, I think a lot of our discussion um, and exposure and risk is around the, 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 the RDF, non recyclable waste, which goes to Europe. And can you elaborate on what the risks are around that then, from the, R the RDF perspective? Well, in, in the, the first initial risk had been whether we could still continue to export this RDF. As the UK as a whole, we're exporting three and a half million tonnes of this. I think the Scottish figure is a lot less. I think it's around about the 100,000 mark, 100,000 tonne mark. Um, so the biggest concern being could we actually um, export it to Europe? That's been... Um, addressed recently, um, the, 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 the approvals and documentation that allow this waste to be exported um, has been agreed with all the member states in Europe who are happy to allow the continuation of existing procedures to apply. So um, even in a no-deal situation, um, that waste could still be exported. Um, but the problem really is around, um, although there's no legal impediment to stop the waste being exported to Europe, there's still the issue around border controls and, and potential delays and friction. Um, potential talk of tariffs, which you might want to get into, but bigger threat to tariffs is actually the fall in the, the value of the, the sterling exchange rate, which is even worse than any kind of tariffs that might be imposed if, if there was to be a tariff. So it's really just what happens at the border. Um, I gather there's a 5% inspection rule that 5% of all exports are going to be stopped uh, whereas at the moment they just can they just go you know, regardless. So it's going to be a bit of border friction um, around the exports. So no one, I don't think anyone's worried about sort of, um, um, sort of meltdown or Armageddon or, or catastrophic circumstances. It's all about kind of slowing down rather than um, anything too... Potential cost implications. Oh, yes, yeah. right down the supply chain from yeah. there. Stuart Stevenson wanted to come in. Um, that sort of was what I wanted to ask, just whether the impact is economic or environmental, or is it both, and how does the balance come on this narrow subject of RDF? Um, well, it's a, it's a bit of both. It's largely, where we're coming from, it's largely economic 
um, as I've just mentioned, the cost of transports and such like. For environmental, the issue being um, if for any reason they weren't to take our RDF, which I don't think is, is, is feasible, is, is likely, uh, we don't have the capacity in this country to handle it. So we are, for the short term at least, short to medium term, reliant on the export route. Um, so an environmental side of things, the regulations are still there, this will be ruled forward, so I don't think there's any concern around environmental stuff, it's mostly around the economic impacts we're probably concerned about. Okay, uh, Libby Peak. Yeah, I just wanted to, to clarify that there are probably two different types of impact that we might be talking about, specifically just in relation to waste exports. So in the first instance, you've got regulatory impact, which has largely been dealt with as, as much as it can be by government officials and border officials who have ensured, um, as Stephen has said, that we will be able to continue to export waste theoretically. But then you have also operational impacts, and those are expected to be severe for at least three to six months. And there's not much you could do in terms of regulation in order to make sure that it, they're not, because you're going to have plenty of knock-on impacts at the ports, because obviously it's not just waste that you're trying to export, you're trying to export all sorts of other things. And so so you'd expect that waste wouldn't necessarily be prioritised over other things like foods and medicines and whatnot. So there's a, there's a real risk that it will back up at ports, which could be a problem if it's things like paper or RDF, which degrade and are potentially fire hazards and you've got issues to do with storage. Um, and then you've also got um, all sorts of potential impacts just in terms of the availability of lorries to transport things, the availability of labour. Um, a lot of people who work in the waste and resources sector come from Eastern Europe, um, and I heard some figures that after cr the Christmas break, 30% of them haven't come back. So in addition to all the backups, backups at port, you might also get shortages of both lorries, gridlock, uh, to do with gridlock, and also just whether or not lorries are getting into the country to then go out of the country, um, and shortage of labour to, to deal with the waste. Yeah. Anyone else in the panel want to... Linda. I'll pick up more on the on the um, the economic side of things. So yes, environmentally, um, degradable waste cannot be hanging about ports uh, waiting to, to go uh, out the country, and we can't deal with it at the moment ourselves. Um, so we would have to do that. Um, the, as I understand it, we the the agreement is that we can um, ship RDF where it is under an existing agreement. That, that existing agreement will continue, but there are an awful lot of, um, particularly public sector organisations looking uh, to use that route in the next 18 months um, prior to our biodegradable landfill ban coming in in 2021. Uh, so there are new contracts that need to be set up and the timing of them is very important. But under the existing one then, the majority of them are short term, one, one to three year contracts and um, they're all RPI, they're all index linked, most of the contracts rather than fixed price contracts. Uh, so depending on what happens with our inflation rate, I, I've heard from the market that if, if we get um, extraordinary inflation, say 30% inflation, then how do we cope cost-wise um, with those contracts and, and the ability to, to, to pay for that? I mean, any, any kind of waste has got, it's got a value. Mm -hmm. And is it fair to say that, you know, there's competition as to, you know, between countries putting their waste to use this RDF waste? It, could, it, it might just be too expensive, the waste coming from the UK compared to another country. So could we be left with this waste that we haven't actually got a route to, to get rid of it um, effectively because it's too expensive uh, compared to waste coming from other countries as a feedstock for whatever it's well, used for? So for RDF, we, we pay for that that waste to be, be taken right. and used. Okay. So it's a cost to us. So, so that's why the indexation on top of that, right. that gate fee, if you like, for them um, could be... Could be Unpalatable, or, uh -huh. or, or, or not something we can't afford. Which means that we've got then. this waste that we we don't really have the capacity to deal with that in the UK. Not at the moment. No. Right. Okay. No. Uh, Mark, you wanted to ask a question around this. In the long term, does it make sense to be taking this uh, refuse-derived fuel outside of the UK anyway? I mean, how could we actually build the capacity to to recycle greater components of this waste here rather than sending it abroad? Uh, to be to be incinerated. I mean, it, you know, what, what's the time scale for delivering that sort of capacity within the UK? Linda, come back in on that. Um, I'm involved in a number of, of infrastructure projects and, and development projects at the moment. Um, so uh, we are trying to. Uh, it's, it's a sensitive balance of, of 
uh, the long-term availability of that waste with, with everything we're doing to minimise that in the first place and, and projects going forward. The, they are getting built. It, really, a, a five, six-year window is from today would, would get you some residual capacity uh, rather than uh, exporting your waste. So it's, it's not short-term. It's not something we can deal with short-term. Uh, the concern that... that um, is covering all infrastructure and construction projects at the moment is the construction industry and, and you touched on it about manpower and uh, the amount of workers we have from the EU and whether whether they will return home and actually whether there will be uh, construction companies available to, to build this infrastructure even if we wanted it built. Uh, so at the moment what I'm seeing is that uh, the contracts for these are, are, are having clauses put into them but they're not uh, there's not the same clauses getting put into all the construction contracts, so they're all wanting some protection from EU exit uh, at various levels. And, and then for, for a procuring authority, it's very difficult to know what they're actually going to be paying. Again, you can't, you can't get a fixed fee from the market. You don't know if you're actually going to have construction companies that want to deal with you. Um, and there's a, there's a great legal contractual debate going on at the moment about, uh, about what protection we can give. Yes, in Gulland. I think what Linda's really talking about is incineration capacity being built in, in Scotland to deal with the waste rather than exporting. But I think your question was more about recycling capacity or reprocessing capacity here uh, in Scotland. And as you know, uh, you know, we're certainly en route for you know developing a more circular economy here and we have ambitions uh, to do so. These opportunities are real uh, and present for us uh, here in Scotland now in terms of the policy. Uh, framework that's been set out by Scottish Government and been delivered by a number of other uh, partners. Uh, I think the challenge is we need time to do that and I think that's, you know, the, the, the opportunity to export uh, waste at the moment is almost like a buffer until those opportunities are realised. I think if we suddenly have to take all that stuff back here, the focus will just be on how do we get rid of that waste and I think there will be a real challenge in building excess capacity uh, that we don't actually need going forward and it will make it harder uh, in terms of the, the commercial argument for some of these recycling opportunities. We need to take a much more structured approach to that, which is really what ourselves and others are looking at in terms of that reprocessing capacity. So there are things happening. There is a lot of interest in uh, delivering the reprocessing capacity for materials, particularly around plastics uh, and other key materials here in Scotland. But, you know, Brexit doesn't help. I mean, it doesn't help for a number of fronts. Uh, just the uncertainty, I guess, uh, in terms of inward investment, but also companies here... Uh, who are looking to invest in that type of infrastructure, understanding what the the market will look like, the, the global market will look like for Scotland in terms of currency uh, impacts as well as, uh, you know, just, just, you know, the material flow both within Scotland and within the UK as well, which is another aspect of this as well, because if the UK starts to build reprocessing capacity for ma key materials as well, uh, if they're faced with the same challenges as, as we're talking about here, then there's always going to be a, a, an opportunity for our materials to still leave Scotland and go to the rest of the UK, uh, where there's obviously a greater amount of the stuff, I guess, relative to, to our own country. on to, I, I guess, the question that I was going to ask next, which was around the EU circular economy package and whether or not the Scottish government's going to have the capacity to deliver these messages if we're outside the EU. I mean, that's something that we're not going to be part of anymore. But I imagine the aspiration is there to, you know... The aspirations are exactly the same, uh, 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 very much aligned to the European package. In fact, you know, I think we'd go further and say, you know, Scottish ambitions go further than uh, the EU package. Uh, and certainly, I think, in terms of our activities in the circular economy, we're, 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 we're ahead uh, of most of the EU states. Uh, member states in terms of developing the framework and you know the, the sort of programs to deliver a circular economy we've, we've been up and running for some time uh, as you know so I think we're already seen as a leader uh, in the circular economy but I think you know aspects of, of Brexit could uh, severely dent that, that, that journey so to speak in terms of the focus obviously everybody's talking about Brexit uh, or EU exit, rather than thinking about both climate change, resource efficiency in the circular economy. That's, that's a real challenge for us, uh, particularly talking to some of the uh, SMEs that we engage with in Scotland, uh, you know, particularly things like food waste. Uh, they're much more, obvious, for obvious reasons, are sort of very worried about what's going to happen uh, if there's a sudden exit from the EU in terms of logistics and getting rid of their uh, produce rather than thinking about food waste. So there's some real challenges uh, in terms of 
the uncertainty and how do we tackle that, uh, both from an individual business point of view, even a consumer point of view, but ultimately investment. We need investment, <coughs> and we've seen a lot of interest uh, in Scotland from outside of Scotland and internally because of the ambition and the policy framework that the Scottish Government is leading on. Uh, but, you know, all the aspects of, of trade and tariffs and currency, that, that creates a degree of uncertainty at this moment in time. Rebecca Walker. Um, just from SEPA's preparation here, um, an important part of our preparation work with the Scottish Government is to ensure environmental legislation continues to operate at EU exit day. And from our point of view, in terms of the requirements and standards on businesses, there is no reduction here. And we'd like, um, we're looking for the same compliance in terms of their authorizations. Um, we're continuing to work with them on compliance, but also in terms of looking at where we can move beyond compliance. As Ian said, we do have ambitions in um, Scotland that go beyond and to see how we can help businesses look for opportunities around circular economy here. Okay. Uh, Claudia, you wanted to ask a, a quick question. Thank you, Kavina. It, it was just a very um, brief supplementary, um, possibly only for Ian um, Gullen, but if, if other panel members want to answer as well. You've highlighted some of the challenges, but, but very clearly the opportunities that there are in relation to the circular economy. And um, I'm wondering um, to, to what extent, I mean, I know that Zero Waste Scotland looks a lot at supporting SMEs and, and within um, communities, and I, I'm... I'm wondering to what extent you're able to really assess the impact that new ventures will have on communities and to preempt that a bit because it's a good to be ahead of the curve in this, you know, um, with incineration and different different things that might cause community concern. Well, I, I, st I still think, uh, I still believe the opportunities in the circular economy are across Scotland. I mean, you know, and they could be embraced by individual communities in terms of some of those uh, social enterprises and, and small businesses in terms of reuse and repair, we've seen a lot of interest in that. Uh, so I think, I mean, I think that's one of the, the kind of opportunities in the circular economy is that it isn't just about building big facilities, you know, in the middle of Scotland. Uh, it's about diversity across the whole of the landscape uh, and those opportunities, whether that's dealing with the materials at source or dealing with materials within the communities instead of trucking them around, I think, uh, we're even seeing the scalability of some of those uh, technologies are, are at a smaller scale than they were bigger, you know, in terms of even dealing with organic waste. So I, I, I think that's, you know, I know I've been here before, I think that is the real excitement of the circular economy, that this isn't just about dealing with waste in the old traditional way where we build it up and try to get somebody to build something of, of a large scale to deal with it. This, this is much more uh, distributive across the economy. And I think that's you know, our work that we've done in the cities in Glasgow, uh, particularly, uh, but also now in the, the Northeast uh, and now in Edinburgh and, and moving out to, to work in Highlands and Islands and some of the islands. I mean, these opportunities are real and people are recognizing them at even an economic development level in terms of small business opportunities and engaging with communities. Uh, and I think that's what the excitement thing, I, as I've said before, I think that's what puts Scotland uh, in the lead, uh, that it's not just trying to deal with waste, it is actually trying to d develop a different system where, where there's jobs and social opportunities as well. Scott. Uh, thank you very much. Could, uh, you've spoken about the opportunities of a circular economy. Could you just give me one or two practical examples? You don't all have to reply, but just one or two practical examples of um, the opportunities that will arise from the, the, the development of a circular economy. Green Alliance has done some research with RAP, the Waste and Resources Action Programme, on job opportunities from the circular economy and found that across the UK, if there's a really transformational shift to a more circular economy, which involves things like treating organic waste differently, open and closed loop recycling as a, as a last resort, but a lot more emphasis on repair and remanufacturing and things like that. And it found, we found that in a transformational situation, you'd, you'd get 102,000 jobs, net jobs, across the UK from, from changing the approach. And these are jobs that occur across the skills spectrum, low skilled to high skilled, um, and quite often in areas that used to have industry and, and now don't have industry, because then people, people will be using their new skills to, to repair and remanufacture things. 
Um, and so there's, there's job opportunities. There's also opportunities in terms of infrastructure, if you're looking at closed loop infrastructure, in terms of having things like more plastic recycling plants or anaerobic digestion facilities, which, which have good jobs in them um, when, when you're dealing with waste and resources in the, in the appropriate way. Thank you. Anyone else got one or two opportunities? I mean, things like refurbishing fridges or, or cars or what? Uh, I'm just asking the daft laddie questions, but as a, as a hill farmer declaring an interest, I've made do and mend all of my life and recycled and refurbished everything I've ever had or owned, turned it into something for the next generation. But is it more than that? a really big part of it. You, you've got that, but then you, you're, you're looking at the whole economy, so, so dealing with every single resource stream differently, dealing with manufacturing processes differently, so putting fewer resources into manufacturing processes to begin with, um, constructing things differently. Construction has a massive environmental impact, and, and if you changed the approach to, to construction, you could drastically decrease the amount of carbon emissions and resources that go into it. So, so it's really the entire thinking about the entire economy. Um, but yes, the refurbishing things is, is a big part of it. I think the, the circular economy has really focused things on, on upstream and, 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 uh, and, and looking towards um, reducing that waste and, and not having a, a waste management industry and, and now we talk about a materials management industry rather than a, 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 a waste industry. Um, so certainly it's about um, remanufacturing and, and redesign so so in, in front of that so that we never have to, to deal with the waste. So they, it's, it's commonly said that uh, if there's a waste then it hasn't been design, designed correctly uh, and there's a real focus on that, on, on that uh, don't produce uh, something that can't last and can't be uh, disassembled and and, uh, and reused in the future. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on a comment about jobs because we keep talking about the opportunities that of, of jobs and, and my comment about um, about workforce uh, doesn't isn't just about incineration and, and, and back end. It's a, it's, a, it's a general workforce concern, not just for the waste industry. I think it's I think it's a, a, across Scotland, but we are uh, an, an industry or, or uh, in, in materials management. It, it is a high a high intensive. Um, job opportunity, uh, but again, we are reliant heavily on EU staff at the moment for that, uh, and we don't know what's going to happen with that in the future. Okay. A universally agreed view. Right, well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on now, Chana, to question yes. two. Um, and we want to talk about no deal and EU uncertainty. So what are the key risks of a no deal at this stage, and what involvement have you had one or two of you uh, in a no deal planning? Rebecca. Um, we've worked very closely with Scottish Government in providing technical expertise and advice in preparation for EU exit and um, this is for all potential outcomes. Recently our focus has been on a no deal. Um, it's mainly to ensure that Scotland's environmental standards are protected after we leave. Um, the risk for us in terms of um, what could happen in terms of New Deal is waste storage and delays and disruptions at, um, at ports. So that relates back to the initial question on exports. Um, so we have done scenario planning. We have set up an internal governance group within SEPA and we've um, carried out scenario planning with Scottish Government here. Um, in delay and disruption at ports, um, waste operators, they'd be advised to temporarily store their waste on site within their permit conditions and they would encourage them if they were unable to do that or find an alternative place for excess storage to engage in early dialogue with SEPA. We have also carried out looking at the capacity in terms of if we do have that delay and disruption at ports for waste for waste exports, if we do have the capacity to deal with um, that waste in Scotland, and it came to the conclusion we do. The other alternative is, or not alternative, the other part of the um, scenario is that there'll be perishable goods at port that then become waste, and what can we do with them? And it's the advice that we'd want to see them dealt with in line with the waste hierarchy. So that would be to redistribute to animal feed, to anaerobic digestion, composting, energy from waste, and finally, um, landfill. So we would work with those businesses if that became um, a reality. Yeah, okay. um, so Green Alliance convenes Greener UK, which is a network of environmental NGOs that are watching the Brexit process to try to make sure that it harms, that it doesn't harm the environment, and that 
standards are indeed enhanced. And so we've been watching the SI process um, go, go through the parliament in Westminster and would say that um, the pace of legislation that has been coming through has been absolutely relentless. It's now largely complete, but there are over 10,000 pages of um, technical legislation that has now been passed, and, and a quarter of that has been laid by DEFRA, so it's going to affect the environment. And we haven't had the capacity to study absolutely everything very, very carefully, but what we have seen is quite worrying, the things that we've noticed. First of all, there hasn't been proper stakeholder engagement from the start. Um, DEFRA belatedly set up a reading room so we could look at things, legislation, before it was officially laid, but it came so late in the process that um, problems haven't been rectified and it was too late to do anything. Um, and while the process was intended to be largely technical, um, to make sure that the, the legislation could function, um, the regime could function on in in the event of a no-deal exit or whenever we do exit. And that's largely true. There have been omissions and worrying changes that aren't just technical. So there's, in, quite often there have been things like they've stripped away the requirements to report to the European Commission. Um, and they've also done things like got rid of committees, advisory committees, um, not, not necessarily in the waste legislation that you're looking at now, but in the REACH legislation that you will be looking at, they stripped away. So overnight, the advisory committees on socioeconomic impact and risk assessment and the member state committee will disappear, and they haven't been replaced with anything robust to make sure that the UK system is as good as the EU system that we're leaving. So there are very real concerns about the SI, <coughs> the SI process. And I would say that now that we have, the, now that the immediate threat of a no-deal exit has dis diminished, um, it would be a good opportunity to, to call for that to be reviewed and for some changes to be made to those SIs to make sure that they are adequate and up to the task of ensuring that the environment is as protected when we leave Brexit as it is now, because it, in the current situation, it's not going to be. So is that the view generally then that the SIs that have been passed by the UK government are not fit for purpose? Or just yours? Um, well, I'm not... Uh, it's, it's definitely my view. Um, but it's the, the view of Greener UK um, in general is that, that there, are, there are mistakes that need to be, to be rectified and we need to look at some things again. Um, and there is the possibility to do so. The, the REACH SI that, ha that was approved has already actually been amended by two further negative SIs. Unfortunately, they don't address our concerns with them, but it does show that, the, that technical problems are, are, it's possible to address them through further secondary legislation. Right. Uh, um, just come on, on the waste specific SIs, so there were two that came in at UK level, um, the first one, the Waste Miscellaneous Amendments EU regulations, they were there to correct deficiencies in terms of there was a reference to EU law or an institution that needed to change, and again there was no change in policy, so that's been transferred over to keep the same environmental standards as the EU. Um, there was a second one with the same name here, the Waste Miscellaneous Amendments. EU exit number two regulations, and that was to address the producer responsibility um, regimes for end-of-life vehicles, packaging, batteries, and waste electrical and electronic equipment. And again, there was no change in policy. It was there to correct um, deficiencies, what are references to EU law or fixes, but it was to keep the same environmental standards. So they were quite a straightforward swap in terms of the environmental standards. And then there was the um, Scotland one in terms of amendments needed around technical standards, for example, landfills um, and end-of-life vehicles and waste electrical and electronic equipment and batteries. So in terms of the waste um, legislation for the two UK statutory instruments and the Scotland statutory instrument, then we're comfortable they've moved over into the environmental standards as is. Thank you. Stephen Freeland wanted to come in. Mm, yeah, just going back to the original question around um, no deal Brexit. Um, there's been talk of um, around contingency planning and such like and one of the, the common um, sort of issues just now is people talking about increasing storage on waste sites uh, to allow more stuff to be so We're a little bit concerned about that. Um, we, we as a responsible industry have got a very broad spectrum of people in this industry. And unfortunately, as I'm probably well aware, waste crime is a big issue for um, the country and the sector as a whole. And the concern being by giving additional um, storage um, um, changes or extensions to storage requirements could open the door for waste crime if we're not if we're not very careful. So rather than the, the permitting and storage side, I think maybe some flexibility on the planning consents 
some of you allowing um, planning consent to be more flexible, opening hours of throughput to allow them to deal with bottlenecks and, and, and such like might be a slightly better way rather than, than the, the permitting side. And the last point in contingency, um, and this might go down like a lead balloon, but landfill capacity is really the only flexible option for contingency. If there's stuff piling off in the port and it's, it's spoilt or it can't, we can't do anything, can't be recycled, it can only go to landfill. And we're in a sector, we're not you know, in the business of just landfilling stuff. We, we don't have to, it's a last resort. Um, but it is the backstop. Um, in 2021, we're going to be in a very tricky position and with the landfill ban coming in place in Scotland where we can't landfill this stuff. So the question of where is it going to go? I suppose it takes me nicely to the next question. What preparations have SEPA and others made to provide support to waste operators facing disruption? And would SEPA anticipate an increase in waste-related crime in the event of the no deal? I mean, we're getting into the nitty-gritty now. What we're going to do with this stuff, as you've just said, landfill is a position of last resort, but that would cost operators money. So uh, what are the attendant risks? OK. Um as mentioned, we've been preparing for all outcomes here. Um, we've been working closely with operators and the communication of the messages that environmental laws aren't changing, environmental authorizations stand there, but obviously there could be, in the event of a new deal, there could be disruption here. Um, so we're asking for early dialogue to engage with businesses in terms of their contingency plans. In terms of waste crime, Absolutely, we will continue to disrupt, prevent and carry out. We're absolutely committed to tackling waste crime here and understanding the risks and threats and harms that could be caused by it in the event of a new deal. So you've had discussions with Police Scotland and, and others in this regard? Through the groups that my waste crime colleagues sit on, yes. Thanks. Another quick question. I, I just wanted to go back to the SIs and just be clear what we're talking about here. Um, what I seem to hear from SEPA was that the rules post the changes remain the same. But what I was hearing from Libby, I think, told me that the oversight was reduced. Is that a fair characterization of what I heard, that the rules are the same, but the concerns that the environmental groups have is that the oversight is reduced? Is that my understanding correct? So in, in regards to specifically the waste legislation, yes, that's right. So so far as we can tell, the, the SIs for waste have largely just been technical. That isn't true across the SIs. A, a lot of them have had much more major changes. But when it comes to waste, yes, they, they have been largely technical changes, but there are real concerns going forward in terms of governance. Um, so we don't yet know what is going to replace across the UK the, the functions that the European Commission and the European Court of Justice have served. And so they've been incredibly effective in, in focusing minds, in monitoring and setting targets, in making sure that um, member states do meet the targets. And a lot of the notices that have been served against the UK, well, about 14% of the notices that were served against the UK related to environmental matters, but almost half of the infringement actions were related to environmental matters. And so having good oversight is incredibly important for things like this, um, for, for environmental matters, because there's no one to speak for it. Um, and those functions, we're not entirely sure how they're going to be replaced. So England is, is consulting, it has proposed an office for environmental protection to, to replace the functions. Um, but so far, that's just for England, and it's not as good as the European Court of Justice. It's not going to be fully independent because the, the um, committee and the budget are going to be set by the Secretary of State. It's going to have the ability to start court proceedings but not to issue fines. And in terms of environmental principles, it only, people will only, ministers will only ha have to have regard to the principles um, that are set out in a policy statement, which is really just a tick box exercise. So what England is proposing isn't adequate, and it's not yet, sh it's not yet clear how things are going to be administered across the UK, because while environmental matters are quite often devolved for, for the past 40 odd years, they've been administered through the common framework of the EU, and so it's not yet clear what's going to happen um, af after Brexit in, in terms of devolution and governance. A, a good chance for to move on to your... Well, yes, yeah. uh, Finn, but I just was going to suggest, I think if uh, Libby Peake could perhaps tell us 
in writing after the specific rules whether there are issues, because I think the general point about oversight is understood, but the rules are something which I suspect we might wish to engage in after this meeting in other ways, if we can I, I, I agree with Stuart yeah. Stevenson. If the specific concerns could be put to us in writing, we'd be very grateful. Yeah, it, we're moving on to talking about common frameworks. Um, Finlay Carson. Yeah, it, it appears that within the remit of the committee, there's, there's four areas specifically, which include chemicals and waste. Um, can the, the panel uh, tell me what you'll be looking at when it comes to common frameworks for waste to be delivered? Just as a general observation, I think that the because of the SI process, the work on common frameworks seems to have stalled. I know that the, the government did publish uh, an additional report saying that they were going to be consulting and engaging more from March 2019. But I think that the, 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 the progress on common frameworks has been quite slow from, from what we've seen. Uh, I think with waste in particular, I, I find it a bit confusing that waste is um, split into two different... Um, sections, one of, one of which requires, might require a, a legislative framework um, and one of which might, they think might require a non-legislative framework. And I'm not clear why those two distinctions have been made, especially as there are some instances where the, two, the different bits of legislation that they're splitting at an EU level were designed to work together. So waste, electrical and electronic equipment, that directive is in, in one category, but the restriction of hazardous substances is in another category. But those, those two things should be working together. Um, so it's not clear to me why those have been split, and we would like to see a lot more explanation and, and a lot more action with the devolved administration from, from the central UK. Government. The panel want to answer that? Rebecca Walker. Just to add, we're aware of common frame frameworks in, in our capacity as the Environment Protection Agency. We would provide technical advice and expertise to the Scottish Government if it was required on the practical implementation of regulations and legislation here. Just going back to, to Libby's co comments, um, in what circumstances uh, would non-legislative approach be more appropriate than to actually having legislation? when it comes to the common uh, frameworks. Because that the example you gave suggested it maybe wasn't most appropriate, but is there other areas where it would be to have a divergence? Um, personally, I'd like to see a lot more explanation from the central government about what these categories are and how they have decided what goes into what category, because that's not clear to me. Um, I'd say in, in most instances it would be to do with waste and, and resources. It would be good to have some sort of common understanding and, and common regulations that the different administrations would be free to exceed, but they're all operating on a, on a level playing field, as is the case at the moment um, with EU legislation, because obviously, as, as Ian said, the, Scotland has gone farther in some instances, so you'd want to see that continue. Okay, I'd, I'd move on to another point. Um, there's already policy divergence within the UK in terms of recycling uh, and landfill targets and some aspects of waste regulation. Do those cause transboundary problems at the moment? Potentially, going forward, they might. Um, as I've alluded to, the, the landfill ban, um, not only have we got waste crime as a, an issue just now, you can have a million tonnes of waste where we can't, there's no capacity in Scotland to deal with a million tonnes of waste. It's going to have to go to, to English landfill sites. Um, so whenever, whenever it's on the move, um, there's going to be a cost increase associated with that. As soon as you get a cost increase, you've got scope for, for waste crime. So, um, yeah, the, the, the regional differences um, are, at the moment, broadly workable. Um, it can be a bit frustrating sometimes of different requirements, but any sort of business risk can, you know, can, can manage that. Um, what we're all in the same boat is, is um, stalling recycling rates. Our recycling rates are sat around about 45, 46% and not really going up. Um, so that's going to be a common issue that we're all going to have to be addressing going forward. Uh, just, just to add to that, yeah, the, the expectation is that because of the landfill ban that's coming in in Scotland, um, 
and the fact that Scotland doesn't have the capacity to deal with this, it will largely go across the border to England um, and could potentially result in increases in waste crime. But I think you could easily see impacts from divergences on things like if you set, if Scotland sets a different rate of landfill tax or if Wales sets a different say, uh, rate of landfill tax, then that would immediately give people incentives to, to try to get round the higher landfill tax some way to, to send their waste elsewhere. And so you could easily see impacts from divergence in policies, which to date we haven't really seen too much of. This, this is maybe one for Rebecca uh, Walker. So how, how is UK policy divergence managed at the moment? So for example, the difference in landfill rates and whatever, how, how does SEPA engage to, um, to you know, manage those divergence? We, we work closely with our colleagues in the environment agencies and the other UK administrations. At the moment, we don't have a difference in the landfill rate. Um, there will be a difference when the, bio, as Stephen mentioned, when the biodegradable municipal waste ban comes in on the 1st of January 2021. Um, this is only coming in in Scotland and not the rest of the UK. So we then anticipate what could happen as a result of that. We work with colleagues in the other environment agencies to understand um, where it might have an adverse impact in terms of the movement of waste. Um, where there might be um, crime opportunities that um, might be um, sought after to understand that in terms of the movement of waste. And so we would work closely with colleagues across the border. Stevenson? Um, I think the last thing on the common frameworks is just uh, what uh, we're expecting in the way of engagement for the development of common frameworks that will apply across the UK and substitute for what's happening in Europe. Is, is that consultation with the UK government who are driving this uh, started? And if so, when, if not, when does it have to? Uh, so I've heard that it was meant to start in March, wider consultations, and, and they've said in their report that they were engaging behind the scenes with, with stakeholders previously. Um, we haven't been engaged um, very much, apart from in the, the initial assessment of what would require um, common frameworks. Um, so I don't think that it's yet clear. They, they've promised that they would have wider consultations, but I would say that if, if the standards of consultations on the SIs are anything to go by, that won't be adequate. Um, they, they've been very cursory, uh, and so you would want much more detailed and extensive and rigorous um, consultations with stakeholders, but also much more involvement with the devolved administrations. So, so with the devolved administrations, they have agreed a set of principles, which are very good principles, but I don't think that they've yet been reflected in anything that we've seen result from the process. Can I, can I just be clear roughly how many organisations the Green Alliance represents and the geographical spread? So Green Alliance is an independent charity and think tank. The, the name is slightly misleading. Uh, we're, we're not an alliance, although we do ha convene an alliance of 14 major environmental organisations that respond to Brexit, and that's called Greener UK. Um, so organisations like RSPB, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, National Trust, and so on. So, and all the, 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 the representations of these well, the various organisations that exist in the different jurisdictions are in there? In uh, geographical scope, so we, we, um, we work with the link groups as well in, in Scotland and Wales. They're not official members, but we do work with them. Right, so, 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 so therefore what we're hearing is that the consultation process really hasn't started and you haven't an indication yet of when it will start either. Now, what about industry groups? Are you, are you hearing um, about consultation on this? I'm getting shaking heads. It's just very, very simple. It's just not happening, convenient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on to questions from Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. And uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, drill down a, a bit further into environmental governance and principles. And uh, uh, Libby, you've already highlighted issues around um, the Office for Environmental Protection in, um, uh, in, uh, in England. Um, but as, as you'll all know, but for the record, there, there um, is a current Scottish Government consultation on environmental governance and principles. Um, and uh, I'm wondering in relation to waste management, um, whether those broad EU principles are being picked up in the Scottish Government consultation and there's the opportunity to shape the future positively. So I don't know who would like to start on that. 
do you see in terms of governance? We've been participating in the stakeholder workshops organised by Scottish Government to support the current consultation on environmental principles and governance. Um, and we're actively looking at it at the moment. And it goes to our agency board at the end of um, this month for consideration. And we'd be happy to share it with the committee um, at this point, should you wish us to. Could you perhaps highlight for us, uh, Rebecca, the, the what um, CEPA would see as the key um, governance functions fulfilled at EU level at the moment that will have to be transposed? Um, I think at this stage, um, given our consultation response, it hasn't been considered by our agency board. I'd be happy to share it at the point once it has been considered by them in terms of our consultation response and provide this in writing to the committee. Right. And can anybody else highlight... Um, in terms of what the, the principal um, uh, EU-level EU uh, governance issues are that will have to be transferred and, and perhaps suggest a, a positive model um, for, for Scotland, which, which is very complex. And I noted what you said, Libby, about um, the, there isn't the separation from government at, at, in, in England, certainly, uh, and also there's not the possibility of of setting fines and so obviously we've got the criminal proceedings for something like environmental waste but but there are other issues uh, you know there may be waste infraction uh, uh, you know and things like that so it would be helpful to know if there are any views on these issues at this stage I think that the things that need to be replaced are, are monitoring and enforcement and you do definitely want to have something that is independent of government, can, can take government to court and can issue fines. And I'd say ideally you'd want something that could work either in harmony or, or be part of the same organisation that England is proposing. Um, so, so it would be environmental matters obviously don't necessarily respect borders, so it would be very important that the different administrations work together in some ways to, to protect it. Are there other comments on that at all? Yes. Mm, I've been hearing fairly positive signs at the, the high level principles around the polluter pays and precautionary principle. All these are hopefully going to be sort of subsumed into our domestic um, framework and retained, which I think is very important. Um, but then maybe there might be scope to you know, improve upon some of these principles. So rather than having the waste um, hierarchy, could we not maybe change that to more aligned with circular economy or resource management hierarchy, which allows some of these models, which we've been talking about, the refurbishment and such like, to have a sort of stronger, um, reflected better in a, in a revised hierarchy. Um, so o overall, we're hearing that good signs that it's we're not going to, hopefully going to lose any of the, the high-level principles. I don't really think there's any, any sort of appetite to, to shun those at all or, or to, to water them down by any means. And is there any view on, on how that relates to um, any possible courts which would replace some EU courts at all? It's, it, might be, it might be quite tricky. I mean, part of the, um, until quite recently, it was quite hard to even get a the courts understand some of the technicalities around waste and crime and some of the issues we've been dealing with around waste policy. So it's a, going to be quite a steep learning curve, I think, but um, um, it's going to have to be addressed in some means. What, what, what do you see then as a, a replacement for the European Court of Justice? What would be the ideal to come out of this process? Because there is a question here about who watches the watchers. It's obviously perhaps difficult for SEPA to pass comment on something which you know you would be part of being held to account as well under a, a replacement system for European Court of Justice. So, I don't know if Libby Peake has got any any thoughts on that. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I do think that that is a, a particular challenge, um, and it's it's quite difficult to set up a, a body within the UK that's going to hold the UK government to account. Um, but that's why you need to, to make sure in setting it up that it is absolutely separate from government and it's not going to be appointed by government and, and it can do things like issue fines. Okay. Okay. Um, Mark, did you ha want to move on to other questions around this? Or are you happy um, with I that? had a, a supplementary, perhaps after Angus. But okay. Yeah. Um, move on to questions from Angus MacDonald. <coughs> Okay, thanks, um, Camina, and good morning to the panel. If I could turn to uh, funding and other EU support structures, 
Um, I'd be keen to hear the, the panel's view on what the, the key EU funding streams are uh, 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 for, for the waste and resource sector in Scotland and what could the implications of losing those funding streams be. Um, and I'd be keen to hear from the whole panel, but um, when Ian Gallen responds, uh, I'd be particularly keen to hear how Zero Waste Scotland uh, are planning for the EU exit, in particular given uh, Zero Waste Scotland is partly funded through the ERDF fund. So, I guess, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, so, as you know, yeah, we, we are secured access to ERDF funding at the moment, so obviously that is uh, at this moment in time continuing. Uh, there's a, there was a commitment made that programmes that were already up and running would, would uh, receive continued support uh, to 2023. Uh, so we are, although that's not formalised yet, that's in, we anticipate that that money will still be available to us and obviously we have, we have been using that uh, money uh, match with Scottish Government money to accelerate support for businesses in the circular economy, so it's been very, very critical to that. Uh, we obviously are aware that there is conversations at UK level about a follow-on fund, I can't, forgive me, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, uh, looking at something that would come in to, to support those types of projects beyond that, or certainly another type of fund that proposal in terms of structural funds. But that, that's been key to us uh, in terms of existing work that we're involved in. So, you know, not having access to that type of funding would, would have significant impacts on our ability to support particular SMEs and, uh, and social, social enterprises and the wider community work that we do uh, in terms of the circular economy. What's also very important is that the, the EU are, you know, looking at their own fund in terms of Horizon and, and life funding and all those sort of things and, and putting considerable amount of money, uh, hundreds of millions of pounds, uh, hundreds of millions of euros into those funds, particularly around the circular economy. So to back up the point about the package uh, now uh, being adopted by the Parliament and Member States now uh, beginning to develop their own programmes and investment, uh, the EU is putting significant funds uh, in, into those programmes as we speak uh, and looking forward. So again, not having access to that funding is, is to some extent going to put us at a disadvantage from other member states. Uh, and, and so again, that, that's possibly quite critical to us thinking where that investment is going to come from because this is about investment. This is about investment in new infrastructure, in new ways of working, new business opportunities, both <coughs> individually and collective supply chains coming together to redesign the use and consumption of materials uh, in a much more circular way. This, this, is, this is not just about you know, be behavioural change, which is at the heart of it, but this is about engaging in new systems and new infrastructure. So having that investment uh, available to us will be critical. Uh, but it is something that we're, we've got a watching brief on. But there's other... Uh, <clears throat> what sits beside that as well is, is the, our ability to work in partnership with EU member states or uh, partners over there. Uh, on some of these projects, so we've secured some of those projects in the past. We would also be looking to do that in the future uh, with uh, whether that's universities and colleges or other uh, technology institutions across Europe to develop our knowledge and skills, but also to share and, and uh, you know, what we're doing here in Scotland. And all those things, as you would imagine, are uh, uncertain. Uh, in terms of the EU exit, how strong those relationships and partners can be maintained, particularly in terms of EU funding programmes uh, going forward. Yeah, sorry. Um, Linda, that's okay. Well, did you have a, a follow up? For well, uh, yeah, I was just going to mention the Horizon, uh, you, you raised the Horizon issue. Now, obviously, Horizon 2020 is coming to an end. I think it's getting replaced by Horizon Europe. Um, now, when we went to Brussels, we, we heard from the Norwegian Directorate who have tapped in quite successfully to Horizon 2020. Uh, would you see any difficulties in tapping into Horizon Europe once it's underway? And, I mean, again, it comes down to the point of what type of EU exit will we have in terms of that relationship. But yeah, there's obviously uh, learnings from other countries such as Norway. Uh, and how they've interacted with European funding in the past that we, you know, we, we will learn from and that's something we're, we're actively engaging uh, with other 
types of partners, other types of bodies to understand how they've accessed money in the past and how we might access it in the future. Obviously, and as well as that, uh, talking to our university partners here in Scotland, who are obviously key to us in terms of developing the circular economy, who have possibly more experience of accessing European funding and, and learning from their knowledge as well. So all of that is is definitely still on the table, but uh, something that we need to start seriously thinking about how, depending on what EU exit model we have, uh, how available those funds will be. It just makes us slightly uncertain again in terms of trying to engage with partners around some of that funding and starting to build up your project, uh, which takes a lot of time in terms of European funding from an idea and bring, building the partnerships when there's so much uncertainty about our actual relationship in some of those partnerships, more formal. Uh, in terms of accessing that funding as at this moment in time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I would say um, generally, as an, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, then public and private sector, we're, we're not an industry that is reliant hugely on, on EU funding. Um, where, where there is investment made in the, in the sector on a day-to-day -day basis, it's either public sector through potential borrowing or through private sector investment. Uh, and that's global private sector investment. So it, it's not something that... Um, particularly concerns us on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the, the ERDF funding is the only kind of exposure, I suppose, uh, through Zero Waste Scotland, and, and that's more particularly on, on upstream businesses rather than, than the kind of traditional waste management. But it might have effect on innovation that's done in, in you know, university sector, presumably as well, which is another, it's another sector, but it has an impact on your sector. Ian Gulland. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, in terms of... Uh, the relationship we now have with universities about innovation, technology, as well as system thinking, uh, all of that is, uh, you know, has been developed over the last couple of years. Uh, but that does, you know, to some extent, rely on uh, research, investment, etc., from universities. So that, that potentially is under threat. The other, the other uh, level of investment that is available at the moment is through uh, European Investment Bank. So again, the European Investment Bank have specifically been uh, asked by the EU Commission to look at supporting uh, the transition to a circular economy. So we're talking about major infrastructure here uh, in terms of system thinking. So you know they're beginning to get their, some extent, their heads around this idea uh, of the circular economy. They've, they've created a circular economy team in the EIB. You know we've met with them. So all of those things are potential opportunities for us uh, if we're in the EU. If we're not. Uh, then those things become, uh, it's another avenue that to some extent uh, gets closed off for us. So there's a not, most of the investment opportunities at EU level uh, are certainly considering or being asked to consider by the EU Commission around the circular economy. That's how important it is in terms of shaping the European economy. So having you know, been denied a kind of access to those types of investments mean that we have to find our own way of, uh, to some extent, finding that investment, whether that's from central sources or through private investment. But to some extent, it puts us outside of the box. Mark Rusko, you had a, a small question to ask. Angus, is that OK? Let Mark in and I'll bring, come back to you. OK. Yeah, yeah. Mark. yeah I, was just, I was just struck by what Stephen Freeland had said earlier on, that we're effectively flatlining uh, on progress here and we're flatlining on recycling rates. We're looking at more incineration. We've got an issue about exporting waste for incineration as well. Where is that next really major jump in innovation and technology going to come from then? And is that going to come from the kind of public sector funds that we're discussing now? Or is that going to come from a combination of public and private sector funds? Are we going to see private sector funding of R&D and innovation increase over time? Or are you basically building towards more incineration and the kind of models that perhaps attract shareholders but are not about creating real innovation and... and uh, an interesting technology that could perhaps take us to the next level? I mean, recycling and incineration don't conflict. Um, um, the, 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 the plant is designed to deal with a certain type of waste at a certain level on the waste hierarchy. So while there might be a lot of focus given to energy from waste because it's a large multi-million pound um, investment in equipment, um, that's not to suggest that the eye's been taken off the ball on when it comes to, to recycling. But yeah, clearly there will need to be further investment. A lot of the facilities which have been built in the last eight to ten years will probably require some sort of upgrading, uh, not only to, um, because they're reaching that time, but also there's a lot of changes in the policy framework 
that requires some of these plants to be upgraded or change of spec and change of mission. About building things to burn stuff, I'm talking about innovation in research, technology that is not proven yet, where somebody needs to take a risk here, and it's either the state or it's the private sector. How, how geared up is the private sector to really be investing in transformative technology that are gonna, is going to drive uh, recycling rates and drive waste minimization? Can anybody answer that? Yeah, let me pick. I think that throughout the UK you've seen for a number of years that the only bankable technology that the private sector has been really willing to, to invest in and on a very large scale is incineration or energy from waste infrastructure. And I think that if you want to move away from that sort of model, what's needed is more intervention from the state probably and, and a much more clear policy framework and much more certainty for people who might invest that the direction of travel is going to be sustainable and, and continue in the right direction. And I think in, in that regard, Brexit really doesn't help because throughout the waste sector, whether it's incineration or anything else, people have been reluctant to, to make investment in, in large bits of infrastructure or, or in, in other um, other things to do with, the, with waste and resources. So I, I think that you probably do need strategic direction and, and some directed investment in innovation and, and really need to set out your stall on where you want to go, which, which I mean, you have, you have been doing, to be fair, but, but to go even further. Lynn Dalvins? Yeah, I think that's, that's correct. That innovation needs to come upstream of, of the waste industry. It needs to come in the circular economy and reducing the amount of waste that, that, that we're dealing with. Can I come back to a final question from Angus MacDonald? Yeah, thanks. In addition to the, the funding question I asked earlier, um, there, there are, of course, other EU structures and, and, and collaboration that are uh, important to the sector, uh, including uh, data systems and, and networks of expertise. So um, I, I'd like to hear your views on what impact uh, you see with regard to these uh, support structures that could be challenging after Brexit. Well, uh, I mean, others others might will have a view. I mean, certainly as Airways Scotland, we spent quite a bit of time uh, developing those networks uh, within the rest of the EU and, and beyond uh, in terms of that. So I guess that's that wasn't anything to do with EUX or anything. That, that's just part and parcel of uh, understanding uh, what is happening in the other parts of Europe, uh, interpretation of policy and, and building alliances. So I would hope that they would be maintained and in fact we have a, a program of work to maintain those networks and maintain those uh, interactions with others uh, I mentioned already our cities and regions work there's a lot of interest in, in that across Europe so I guess some of this is about playing to our strengths and, and the things that we can take out there to share with others our carbon metric etc uh, as well as pick up on, on what's happening in other parts of EU specifically as I guess policy if, if we're out of Europe and EU policy evolves we, we want to understand what how that is evolving so we can we can uh, uh, adapt as well so I, I think these things should be maintained. I think the difficulty is that we, you know, we're recognised uh, within the EU Commission. You know, we we get uh, we get meetings, etc. We're you know we're we're part of the infrastructure, or part sorry, part of the landscape scene. You know, I guess anything that starts to distance us from that is going to be quite challenging uh, and in terms of uh, relationships. So, but you know, at the end of the day, it's people meeting people or talking to people. Uh, so I would hope that these things can be maintained. Uh, but as I said, in terms of access to project funding, etc., th those might get they, those could get quite challenging uh, if we're if we're not ex so. Because a lot of the partnerships that are, are kind of built sometimes from a standing start on on a formal engagement around a pro project, they then they, they then go on to other things. But that's usually an entry point for a lot of the partnerships that we've had in the past. So I guess those things that's uncertainty. Yeah, to follow on what Leon said here, it's very important for us as the Environment Protection Agency to maintain these partnerships, collaboration across Europe and further afield, learning from them, sharing knowledge is really important. We're a member of the network of European Environment Protection Agencies and we will continue to be, be part of this um, and continue to collaborate, share ideas and understand how we can work together. We, we have actually run out of time. Um, I, 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 I suppose I would like the panel just to maybe answer one final question. We have got six, a six months period because of, of, of what happened a, a few weeks ago. We've um, had, had a, I suppose, a, the cliff edge is further away, I guess. What would you like to see happen in the next six months that's addressing some of the issues? 
Uh, it's a big question, but maybe just if I can have go around the panel, Ian Gullen. Like, I, I mean, <clears throat> for us, the, the uncertainty, uh, all of the aspects of whether it's waste, recycle it, or all the things we've talked about, uh, that's why, I guess, for us, the ambition and the push for a circular economy is so important. It's a no regrets policy because that builds us uh, a degree of resilience against all of those things. We've seen in the past when, you know, uh, when material uh, prices collapsed in 2008, 2009, you know, it caused a, caused a sh shockwave similar to this to some extent in terms of waste and movement of materials and recycling rates and all of the things just through the uncertainty. So building this idea of a circular economy, investing in the opportunities that our material provide us here, both in terms of end of use, in terms of recycling back into the economy, but more importantly, up front in terms of dealing with some of the, the input, input material that is required by our economy. So over 84% of chief execs in manufacturing in Scotland uh, last year said that the thing that's keeping them awake at night, the most at the top of their, their keeping them with things awake at night was the, was the volatility, the price of raw materials for their businesses. Now that's obviously to do with global politics, but to do with how can we tackle that and using our resources here in Scotland in a much more circular way is at the heart of that. So driving that ambition forward. So yeah, I understand that the, the politics involved in, in, in terms of EU exit and absolutely making that commitment that regardless of what happens, we need a more circular economy, not just for our own economy, but to show that this is the, the direction of travel for the global perspective as well. Would anyone else like to just make a final comment on what you want the next six months to achieve Lynn Darvins. Thank you. We need this resolved as soon as possible. Uh, and, and from, from a public sector point of view, then the majority of waste movement is all under contracts, under public procurement. Um, those contracts are very difficult to negotiate at the moment because we don't know what clauses and what protection and what risks we're trying to manage. Um, and that needs, that needs resolved. So actually pushing us back six months hasn't helped at all. It's now stalled. Uh, in, in terms of, of trying to now get a level playing field in, in procurement and, and commercial land. Thanks. Okay, Libby Pete. Um, and just to, to widen it out a bit to, to more environmental matters, I, I'd, I'd like to see this breathing space used to, to review the SI process and, and to identify deficiencies in it, because there certainly are some that, that could be rectified during this process. But I think above all, the most important thing that we'd like to see is, is the governance gap addressed by, by the central UK government and, and by all the devolved administrations, preferably together, to make sure that going forward, um, after Brexit, the environment is as protected as, as the politicians have said it's going to be. If no one else has got any comments, uh, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, we're going to suspend the meeting briefly to allow the, a change in the panel. Thank you very much for all your time today.
Right, we continue taking evidence on the EU exit and the environment with our second panel uh, focused on chemicals. I'm delighted to welcome to the panel Michael Warhurst, the Executive Director of ChemTrust. Oh, well, he's on the phone. Okay, thank you for perhaps just reminding me of that. Good morning. Good can you hear us? I can hear you, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Maybe, maybe we need to boost your volume a little bit so that we can hear you a bit better. We've got Sylvia Segna from uh, Reach Executive of the Chemical Industries Association. Good morning to you. Um, we have Tom Shields, Acting Chair of Chemical Sciences Scotland. Good morning. And Janice Mill, the Head of Function uh, for the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. And uh, Libby Peake is also in this session as well, uh, continuing from the previous session. So I, I guess I'd, I'd like to ask you the same kind, of, the same question that I asked the previous panel about the key, what you believe the key risks are for the chemical sector um, of EU exit. So if you like to indicate to me if you want to answer, Tom Shields. Hello. Well, good morning, everyone, and I appreciate this uh, opportunity to say a little about chemicals in in Scotland. Uh, just to place it in context, the. Uh, chemicals industry in Scotland is the second largest exporter, manufacturing exporter that is in the country, exporting uh, some 3.91 billion uh, uh, for Scotland in chemicals and, and pharma. That, um, of that figure, 3.17 billion, that's about 80%, goes to the EU. So our exports to the EU are an enormous proportion of the overall exports internationally. Uh, additionally, we, we import well uh, over 60% of our raw materials from Europe, from the EU countries. So we have a really high dependence on the, the, the export of, of chemicals to, to Europe and also the import of uh, chemicals and raw materials, raw materials and intermediates from Europe. And in many cases, the supply chain goes in both directions more than once so that we export a, an intermediate, it gets some processing and then it comes back to the, U, to the UK here in Scotland and then goes back into Europe perhaps as a, as a finished product. So there's, there's quite a lot of um, our business um, that is really threatened if there is a problem um, actually in that supply chain crossing the border between uh, Scotland, the UK and, uh, and Europe. Um, the principal regulation that controls all of, our, all of that traffic is the REACH regulations. That's a regulation that we have spent over 10 years now investing in, uh, in registration and approval of chemicals and getting licenses and putting all the necessary data in place. Our entire industry has been well focused on that and all of our exports and all of our imports really depend on that 80% that portion, depend on reach working effectively for us. So if anything threatens that, so for example, if our reach registrations were not recognized and we had to go back to re-registering, even uh, without testing, that would be an enormous disadvantage to the chemical industry in Scotland and would threaten that economic uh, contribution that, that we make to the Scottish economy. So the thing that I'm most, that our companies are most concerned about is something threatening the very well organized and heavily invested in um, system around reach and uh, so anything that threatens that really threaten, threatens us. So we're really keen to make sure that, uh, that there isn't a problem like that and that we do have uh, the, the flow of trade. That's probably the highest priority. Coming um, high up in the priority list also is access to skills and expertise across the European border because we in Scotland are very high on innovation. Our academic sector, our universities punch well above their weight in terms of the uh, impact they have in bringing forward uh, intellectual property uh, to the market and a lot of that backs up the, the scientific and technical services uh, that we provide as part of the export drive in Scotland. Um, and we depend quite a bit on actually getting um, skills and people to uh, travel here and work here and make their careers here from Europe. And if, if that is threatened, then a lot of the, the powerhouse behind innovation in our sector 
in um, academia would be threatened. A drop-off from that since 2016? Yeah, there has been a little drop-off. Some people have gone home. But there's a great deal of concern amongst the academic community about uh, losing people. And there are people really watch, watching the situation very carefully. So it's a fear about what might happen, I think, if we have a, a hard or a, a Brexit that really threatens uh, academia. One thing that has happened that uh, is, is very concerning is that um, in terms of European funding to research applications, we are finding that um, our proposals are at something of a disadvantage because of the uncertainty around Brexit. So we're finding it more difficult to compete. I'm, I'm getting this from my academic colleagues in the European funding market, if you like, for research. And that's, uh, that's something real that's happening just now. Okay, anyone else like to answer John Smill? <clears throat> people's perspective, our role in REACH has actually strengthened the Health and Safety Executive as the UK Chemicals Agency will have a statutory duty to take SEPA's advice on board. The BP. Um, I would say that in, in contrast to what we were talking about earlier with waste, there are some real regulatory problems that will come about if there's a no-deal exit. Um, with relation to chemicals. So, so as has been alluded to, the, the REACH regime um, at the EU level was one of the most complicated bits of legislation that ever went through the EU. And it's taken 10 years to amass this database that's centrally administered in Helsinki that contains safety dossiers, extensive safety dossiers on 21,000 chemicals. And in the event of a no-deal Brexit or a Brexit in which we're not able to um, negotiate access to the REACH regime, we're going to immediately lose all of that information. Um, and the SI that has been laid before Westminster is completely inadequate, we believe, to, to ensuring that um, the environment and human health is as protected in, in the event of the UK administering its own system um, compared to, to what it is now. So we're going to lose all that information. Has there not been a commitment from the UK government to take all that information and effectively keep the same standards? Are you not getting a sense of that? I mean, so we're part of it right that, now. We have access to all that information. Right. So how are we going to lose it? Yeah, we're, we are going to lose it because the, most of that information has been is owned by private companies and it's been amassed in a dossier with the explicit purpose of being registered in the REACH regime. And so in the event of a of no deal Brexit or, or losing access to REACH, we will immediately lose all of that access and, and UK companies will have to get permission from all of the other people who have been involved in um, creating the, the dossiers to reuse that information. Because at an EU level, they've, um, they've been quite effective in bringing companies together that all use a common chemical and then jointly they've been responsible for identifying or, or running all of the safety information um, and that's going to be lost in the UK system. So, so DEFRA for instance has uh, committed 5.8 million pounds to recreate a, a database to, with the purpose of, of being able to regather that information but on exit day that is going to be an empty database and it's going to have to be repopulated. Could we put this to, to a cabinet secretary, Rosanna Cunningham and, and she said that I consider, I'm going to quote directly from her, consider the likelihood of significant disruption occurring will be low in the short to medium term and I'm satisfied that the new UK regular, regulatory arrangements will be in place upon exit day that will draw on existing expertise and resources to provide an acceptable level of regulation. In a no-deal exit, a UK REACH IT system will be put in place by DEFRA to provide continuity for UK businesses. Well, what's your response to that? That's our Scottish Cabinet Secretary saying that. Yeah, so they have made some allowances to try to ensure that the regulation functions, the, the regime functions on exit day. So they're grandfathering the, and, and recognising the EU data that, that has already been registered, but we will lose all that information. Um, and so while, while it's possible that, that it will function, the UK government will not have access to, to that information. And that they've, they're allowing between six months and, and two years to, to notify and then recreate those dossiers. Um, I think two years is, is probably not the most realistic timescale. It sounds like quite a long time to, to go without those safety dossiers. But it's taken 10 years to create those safety dossiers at an EU level, and we're going to need them in a UK system, and, and we won't have that on exit day. 
I'm going to bring in Sylvia Segna because obviously you have. Yes, I would like to add uh, the fact that the decision to further extend uh, Article 50 and delay Brexit avoided the immediate danger of no deal for the chemical industry, uh, but at the same time, it does further extend uncertainty uh, for, for business. So we need uh, a solution as soon as possible because, of course, the continue, you know, the failure to agree a way forward in time uh, will negatively affect business confidence to invest in the UK. So this is a big risk for uh, the chemical sector. Uh, on uh, chemical uh, um, regulations, uh, we have engaged closely um, with uh, our members and government departments and across parliament to try to address a number of uh, um, legislative gaps we've identified. And uh, we're pleased to see that these are being addressed by, by the government, by, by DEFRA, um, through um, up updated statutory instruments uh, reach. Uh, otherwise, uh, um, without you know, uh, this new uh, amended uh, uh, version of the statutory instrument, uh, com many companies will not be able to mitigate the impact uh, of uh, uh, no Brexit, so will not be able to use the transitional measures that the government has designed to put in place. So, why is that? Sorry? What, why, why, why are certain organisations and companies not able to access that? Uh, the problem uh, was in relation, uh, uh, for example, of um, chemicals registered, uh, chemicals under reach that are imported from outside the European Union and uh, registered by the non-European manufacturer through a representative based in the EU27 countries. Uh, there were no uh, provision in the REACH statutory instrument to allow uh, UK companies importing these chemicals to benefit from a transitional arrangement or to be able to notify uh, within 180 days uh, to the health and safety executive in order to continue to import in the short term uh, before being able to you know, register within two years. So we are pleased to see that uh, um, these gaps uh, being addressed by, uh, by the government. But at the same time, we still have uh, uh, great concerns on REACH and also on other chemical uh, um, regulations and under no deal, specifically on uh, uh, timelines and uh, data sharing issues as highlighted by Libby, and also how we are going to uh, minimize the additional cost that many companies will uh, face uh, uh, post-Brexit uh, because uh, the same product will need to be registered, uh, approved, evaluated both by EU authorities and the uh, UK uh, authorities. And it's, um, it's the fact that of having to respond to two separate uh, um, regimes, we believe that it may turn into a very complex and expensive uh, uh, process that may weaken uh, competitiveness of the uh, UK chemical industry, and also has the potential to reduce the number of chemicals on the UK market. So this is a big uh, risk for the chemical industry. Stuart Stevenson wa wanted to ask you a question. I'd, I'd, I just want to understand who's the owner of the intellectual property that is in the existing European <laughs> database. I think I'm hearing that the intellectual property ownership continues to reside with those who submitted to it. And therefore, each of the companies who submitted to the database is in control of how that data are used here and after. And they have, so therefore, that those 10,000 or whatever the number was, uh, submitters would have to provide authority to the UK to continue to use that. Is, is that my a correct understanding? I'm seeing nodding heads. So I think I've probably got Tom, it correct. Tom Shields? Yes, I, I, I believe the intellectual property rests with those who submitted and, um, and invested in doing the validation and having the tests done and then the registration undertaken. So I think that that information still resides in the, the correct ownership. Um, just, just referring to, to Libby's evidence, I, I don't have the same extreme concern that we will lose a, a large volume of data and we, we too in the industry have been reassured uh, a number of times by government agencies and, and indeed you've pointed to the cabinet secretary's response which is very strong in saying that the, the, the chance of disruption on day one is low 
and that, the, uh, that she's satisfied that UK regulatory arrangements will be in place on exit day. Now, I, I think I take that as it said, but um, I think we all might have experienced and known of large complex IT systems that were swapped onto a duplicate system and then didn't work at all. The banks have had that kind of problem. All sort, the NHS, all sorts of organizations have had problems changing over from uh, large, complex IT systems like EU Reach IT and replicating it with something called UK Reach IT. Now, we remain reassured by the agencies and by government that all will be well should there be a no-deal Brexit. And indeed, we did. you did have some evidence from the HSE um, last time, back in December about this. But I'm, I'm somewhat concerned about the, the sheer fact that it's a really big, complex system and it's an IT-based thing. And I, I, would, I know that you're meeting with the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment um, shortly, and uh, I, I would like to understand the risk assessment that has been undertaken to arrive at the, the opinion that the risk is low of disruption and that there is satisfaction with the UK systems that will be put in place. I'd really like to get a bit more into the, I would I'd advise the committee to, to get a bit more into how has that judgment been made, on what evidence, what risk assessment has been undertaken, was it quantified, was it quali qualification, is it simply opinion, or is there some real substantiation to the view that um, the risk of significant disruption is, is low? And I would advise the committee, so. I, I'm conscious that I haven't uh, addressed Michael Warhurst. Uh, would you like to come in? Yes, please, yeah. So I'm from ChemTrust. We are a charity who focus exclusively on chemicals policy, particularly uh, on the EU level, but also on, on UK, um, trying to make sure that humans and wildlife are well protected. And I, I think the key thing with this database, for example, is that it needs to be clear that the database that's created by the UK in the event of a no deal or for outside reach will be empty. I mean, it'll be a database sitting there, but it won't have the information in it. Whereas the reach database, which is the best one in the world, um, has huge amounts of information. It took several years, quite a few years to develop the database software. And then it took many years, as more than 10 years to get the data in there. So, there's a big difference between an empty database and a full database. <clears throat> um, and the worry really is that the, the UK will put in place this system, which appears to be a copy of the EU system, but it won't have the information. Um, you'll have a very gradual phase in of data, and there's a lot of concerns about how much data industry would have to supply to that and how much that will cost. And you will still end up with a system that doesn't have the same amount of information in it. And the worry is you end up with a system <clears throat> which is sort of a shadow, almost a sort of ghost system, a virtual system that appears to look the same as the EU one, but the reality of what's actually going on inside it is very different. And chemicals policy is very difficult because there are tens of thousands of chemicals in min millions of different products. And keeping a hold on this is very difficult. It's the reason why it's taken so long. Uh, for any jurisdiction to make good progress on it. The EU is the, the strongest, but it's still not in any way perfect. So this, you have this, this challenge. Now, the EU has put in place a complex system, and that system is constantly developing. There are constantly new analyses going on, new data coming in, decisions coming out. And those decisions, currently, the UK has made no commitment to follow those decisions. So the EU will look at something and decide, well, we want to restrict this. We don't want these chemicals in, in till receipts, for example. Um, the UK has made no commitment to copy those decisions. So it's not just the lack of data in the database. It's then that the UK isn't saying it's going to copy any of those decisions. And I think the third point that's worth mentioning is in the EU system is quite an open system in that there are many different meetings, management boards, and different meetings where you have people from the member states around the table, but you also have people from industry and people from environmental groups, consumer groups, unions, and they can all input into the discussion and say, you know, are you sure you haven't probably considered this particular piece of research or this use? So there's a very open process that actually, generally, all the stakeholders are pretty happy with that. But the UK has said, 
in the Withdrawal Act, the way the way it works, you know, you transfer everything from an EU law into UK law, and then you remove the bits that aren't operable. And they said all these committees are not operable. We don't have member states in the UK, so we're just going to put everything inside the HSE, and we get rid of all these stakeholder functions. So you're creating, moving from quite an open system to a very, very closed system. And one of the things that Chemtrust said to DEFRA, it says, why not say, well, actually, we yes, there aren't member states in the UK, but there are devolved administrations, and maybe you can create some committee structures that allow representation of devolved administrations and then also put the stakeholders in there. But DEFRA didn't take that up, so it's all basically subsumed into the HSE uh, with some role for the Secretary of State uh, in London. And But it's a very... The, creating a very closed system to carry out this thing which is, pretends to be a copy of the EU system but isn't. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to, uh, Mark Ruskell has some questions on this broad theme. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up then what, what this means in terms of research um, because if, you know, there will be a database but uh, as I think several people have said, there won't necessarily be everything in it or not, or not certainly not from day one, it may take several years before that, that becomes uh, useful potentially for research. So, so what happens during that, that period? I mean, are there any concerns about where research might go elsewhere within the EU, if there's a, a more comprehensive system that, that you could use in Germany, for example, but you can't use here? I mean, is that a concern about where the research effort moves to within Europe as a result of this or, or not? Would the, anyone the like EU to system is that? open um, um, Mark, to Mark? academic research coming in from other places. Um, so it's not just about European research, uh, however you define European. Um, there are, I mean, one of the things that EU does is, is fund very big, quite big projects looking at specific issues. For example, there's one called Human Biomonitoring, which looks at the level of chemicals in our blood and other, other tissues, and that's a collaborative project across Europe. There's also a set of projects looking at how mixtures of chemicals affect us. Um, at the moment, there are UK partners in those projects. Uh, like all EU funding, there are uncertainties about what happens after Brexit. So I think one of the important things is that the EU is actually a very important funder of research in this area. Um, and the risk is that the UK will start to drift out of those that funding and of, of I mean the, the access to the reach database is not actually easy for academics anywhere in Europe um, although you know governments have access but even they have to be quite cautious about what they do they have to sign contracts and have special security measures so it's more about I think the funding is more important in, in terms of the research around Europe the database is accessible to a level to researchers but it, even that's quite restricted what about private sector though? Sorry, just to respond to, to Mr. Uh, Mark, Mark Russell's point, I mean, the, the REACH database is not primarily about research at all. It's about regulation and safety and ensuring that um, we're using chemicals in, a, in an acceptable way and that they're being controlled. Um, there's a little bit of research involved in being informed by that, but most research wouldn't put its, its important data onto a public system like that. So I have less concern about uh, the data in that respect, um, but I do have a lot of concern about the skills involved in actually creating the intellectual property in the first place. Okay. Would anyone else like, well, like to answer Mark Ruskell's question? No? Mark, you want to? I, mean, I, I think in terms of the impact that you're going to see during the transition period, it's, it, it isn't mainly to do with research, it's to do with the private sector having to refund tests or, or go about paying to get access to the safety information or re having to reconduct tests, potentially even animal tests, testing on animals during that process in order to populate the database. Okay, which is a, is that, is that a significant concern then that, that shared... Yes, it's good. In, Sylvia? Th this is a concern shared by our uh, <coughs> member companies. Uh, <coughs> because companies in the European Union uh, have jointly developed the, the information uh, on the intrinsic properties of chemicals and the risk they pose 
in more than 10 years of compliance we've, uh, we've reached. And now with Brexit, companies have to renegotiate again access to this information to use it again, to, be, to submit it to the UK authority in, in future. Uh, our members are con uh, concerned by the fact that they may not always be able to obtain all the data they need from all the data owners and their dossier would uh, ultimately contain less information than the um, EU equivalent. So, in principle, would not be possible to assess the risk of the substances uh, adequately, unless, of course, industry duplicate testing, and um, this would come with additional cost and, of course, potentially repetition of animal testing. What, what kind of animal testing are we talking about? What kind of products would need to be tested? Um, there are a number of uh, uh, testing methodologies that are uh, uh, required within uh, reach based on uh, the hazard properties of the, the chemicals that you need to look at. So it could be on uh, rabbits. Okay, um, what, what kind of chemicals? Uh, it's all industrial uh, uh, chemicals that need to, you of course, need to comply with reach with um, industry how to develop uh, um, information on the properties based on the tonnage. The highest the tonnage, the highest the tonnage, uh, more stricter the requirements are on, uh, in terms of um, information yeah. requirements. I, I think the message is very clear here that if we do get into a situation where we don't have access to large chunks of data, then it's pretty disastrous for our, our operations. If we have to go back and start revalidating, retesting, and setting up. Um, duplicating the work that we've already done over the past 10 years, that becomes an enormous disadvantage to uh, the Scottish chemicals industry. And we must not get to that position. Um, I, think, I think it remains the fact that if we've done the testing and the research and created some data, that data belongs to us and will be in the system. But because of the complication of a lot of materials going to EU countries and then coming back, and maybe that happening more than once. Um, you know, we've worked very much in an integrated way with, um, with, European, with the European supply chain, and we've all used reach. And if something disrupts that, it becomes very difficult indeed, very difficult to continue business in the way that we've done it in the past. Finn Carson has a, a, a supplementary question. A very, very quick question. Looking at all the evidence and, 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 and what you've already said this morning, how likely or unlikely is it that we're going to have to create our own reach or, or how likely is it that we actually come to an agreement with the, our previous partners to, to use European reach? On a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are we to go one way or t'other, given what we've just heard? I think we will. I, from my point of view... And, sorry. Bring Michael in. Yeah. So, obviously, the UK remains in reach in any transition period, and obviously in this, this extension... The question then is, is what does the UK need to do to stay in afterwards? And our analysis, based on what happened with Switzerland, who also looked at becoming part of REACH, is to the UK would need to pledge, basically, to follow all the decisions of the EU Chemical Agency. We might get to participate in those decisions, but not vote, like as Norway does. We would also need to accept the ECJ or, or potentially EFTA court and we would need to keep in place a, a, quite a wide range of other chemical-related laws, which helps make sure that, that REACH works properly. And you know, our assessment is there is a chance that the UK could do that. It would be, it, I mean, it, it's part of this dynamic alignment discussion that has been going on um, also with Labour and the government at the UK level. Um, so I think it can happen, um, but it's not going to happen by default, and it's not going to happen unless the UK is prepared to make very clear legally binding um, commitments to the EU. And even then, the EU has got to decide that REACH is, as we would argue, important for public health and the environment, and therefore sh should be dealt with outside any debates on cherry-picking the single market. And so, you know, we think it's possible at this point, um, but let's say something like six out of ten because the UK has got to really try and commit. And at the moment, the, the noises on things like dynamic alignment, staying in line with EU law, uh, tend to move backwards and forwards a lot and, t and tend to be quite vague as well, whereas this would require a legal binding 
treaty essential, essentially. Tom Shields, you want to come in? If you on this is, uh, is, is much higher than six out of ten, I'd put it more like eight or nine, and that is because it is in everyone's interest, especially the, the, the large chemical companies around Europe, uh, to have a situation where we cooperate in this matter because we all depend on each other in this very complicated supply chain. So I'm, I'm much more hopeful uh, that, that we would actually get a, a positive outcome to this, but it will require some leadership from from the government. Uh, Libby Peake. And I think it's probably worth pointing out that it does remain the UK government policy to try to get access to the REACH regime through associate membership of the European Chemicals Agency. And both the ministers that were introducing the SI in the House of Commons and the House of Lords did reconfirm that. However, as, as has been alluded to, it's not just up to us. In the event of a no deal exit, we, we would lose access. Absolutely. But if we are able to meet the conditions that the European Union might put on it, then yes, it would be in everyone's interest for the UK to remain a member of REACH. And Matt Ruskell, you had one question before I move on. Um, yeah, it's just a little one about trade deal negotiations. Um, I, I'm wondering if you, if you see any uh, concerns uh, or otherwise around countries outside of the EU seeking a trade deal with the UK, what kind of pressure they may put on the UK um, to, to change our regulatory approach? Would anyone like to tackle that, Tom Shields? I, I don't think Mr. Trump does like reach. Oh. Um, um, and, uh, but, but just remember that's 20% of our business in terms of exports, not the 80%, which is in Europe. So I, I don't see the, the impact being enormous. Uh, Libby? I, mean, I, I, I think that there is, there are two things. There are whether or not the UK manufacturers are going to have to meet the standards. And then there's the other issue of whether or not imports are going to undercut the UK manufacturers. So I think there's always a risk with environmental protections that if we, if we do have the sorts of trade deals that would favour a, a US style approach, then that would damage that could potentially undercut UK producers and expose people and the environment to, to dangerous chemicals. And I'd probably note that the UK doesn't have a really good track record of monitoring the, the information, the, the sorts of chemicals that get placed on the market that shouldn't be placed on the market already. I think um, Michael from Chemtrust might be able to come in on this, but there's a system in, in the EU called RAPEX um, that Chemtrust has done some research into, and, and they found that the UK isn't very active in monitoring what's placed on the market. And we benefit at the moment from notifications from all the other member states who do find if, if a product is, is placed on the market and doesn't meet the regulations, and, and you notify all the other member states so you can take that off the market. So we're going to lose that, and, and it's given our track, rac track record, we won't be picking up all of that work in an independent system. Okay. Angus MacDonald. Yep. I mean, on the, on the issue of um, product safety, we've got to remember that oh, chemicals hang on. I'll bring are in Michael. incorporated in almost everything. I mean, so, so if you buy a toy in a market, then that, chemical, that product will have chemicals in. And, and the research shows that, unfortunately, a lot of toys um, imported into the EU from places like China will have chemicals that are actually banned. Uh, within them and, and, and can leach from them. And the UK, we did a big survey by FOI of councils and discovered that many councils are actually not spending any money on checking out um, markets and shops in their area and what they're selling as regards to chemicals. Um, so it's quite a serious area where the UK is not doing a good job at the moment. And maybe just quickly to, to add to the US issue that was mentioned, if you look, for example, at documents produced in India where you look at what the Indian companies tell the Indian government they want uh, out of an, uh, trade deals, they uh, complain a lot about reach. So I think it's very clear that there would be pressure from around the world um, against the UK using reach and so the UK would have to um, withstand that pressure. And obviously, as has been said, you know, the, the rest of the EU is a much more important trading partner. Okay. Angus MacDonald. Yeah, thanks, convener. It's just um, for clarification, um, Michael Warhurst mentioned uh, a short while ago about the situation between Switzerland and REACH. And we often hear about uh, uh, Norway's relationship with the EU, but we very seldom hear 
uh, how Switzerland deals with the EU. Um, just for the record, um, can you repeat what you said about the arrangement between Switzerland and, and uh, REACH? So the, Switzerland has some very strong relationships with the EU in some areas, but the, I mean, aviation, for example, there is a, a process whereby the Swiss create their rules, they have a joint committee with the EU, and the EU basically only allows the Swiss full flying rights if they obey the EU rules. So the, the, the Swiss appear to have a sovereignty over aviation, but actually they don't because they have to do what the EU tells them to do. On chemicals, the Swiss um, did explore the idea of joining REACH some years ago, um, but in the end they wouldn't accept the three conditions that the EU set, which was following EC, the European Court of Justice, following EU decisions without a vote, though possibly with participation, and keeping other EU law. So the Swiss copy quite a lot of the chemicals law, but they don't, they're not actually part of it. Um, because they weren't able to take um, those decisions. And the Swiss basically have a set, a very large number of different agreements with the EU, um, which to some extent exist independently, um, and they're constantly in joint committees with the EU, where the EU says, well, sorry, you're, you, know, you're, you need to change your rules. Um, there was a big blow-up a few years ago about free movement, because the Swiss are in, are in Schengen as well as having free movement with the EU. Um, so it's a it's a very complex arrangement with the, with Switzerland, but in the case of chemicals, they're not um, actually fully collaborating. Okay, okay. Uh, Sylvia Segna wanted to come in. Just one uh, one addition uh, on the relationship between uh, um, the European Union and Switzerland uh, for for chemicals. One exception is biocides, uh, the the BPR legislation. Uh, there is a bilateral agreement, a mutual recognition agreement that allows. Um, UK regulator and uh, UK companies to um, participate in the implementation of the, the BPR. So I think that is the, the one of the you know, exception I'm aware of. And of course, we would much welcome similar arrangement going forward between the UK and the EU. Thank you. We're going to move on to questions from John Scott. Thank you, convener. In regards to a no deal, the, the REACH EU exit regulations have all already been amended to extend transitional arrangement periods and are now being amended again to address further industry concerns about disruption to supply chains. Do you have any outstanding concerns about these regulations or are you confident that the issues have now been addressed, um, leaving out the database issues? Do you have other issues or not? I mean, I, I would say... Oh. Because it's also the decision-making issue it's both the transparency of the decision making and the extent to which the EU decisions are then taken in the UK as well. Because the UK will rapidly move out of alignment with the EU if it doesn't commit to copy EU decisions. So you will start having chemicals that are banned in the EU that aren't banned here, maybe labelled as a carcinogen in the EU and not in the UK. So that will happen immediately. In, you know, you can argue, oh, well, that shouldn't be in the legislation. It's a policy decision. But that's something that we would like to see happen in the next month, is the government come out with a policy decision to say, well, our position is that we will carry on uh, following exactly what the EU does on chemicals, uh, because otherwise we will have this quite rapid divergence and we're likely to end up in a more deregulated system quite rapidly. Okay. Libby Peek. The main concern to do with the SI is that the original REACH SI, as set out by the EU, includes, as Michael has alluded to, um, it mandates that there are some committees set up to, to help provide oversight and, and well-informed decision-making. So there are three committees, the Committee on Socioeconomic Risk, the one on socio-economic socio impact, the risk assessment, and the member state committee, which resolves differences of opinions. And all of these allow for stakeholder engagement. So people like environmental groups, industry, unions, they can all contribute to the decision-making process. It's, it's very transparent. It's, very, it's clearly well-informed. In the REACH SI, that's, that clause has been omitted entirely. And there's no... There's no um, promise to, to replicate those in a UK system. And instead, what's replaced, what, what replaces it is a duty on the asset HSE, which is the UK competent authority, to seek advice from one or more competent people. And that's a very closed system and, and obviously open to, to 
mistakes being made and, and not being well informed by all the all the various stakeholders. And so what we would like to see is the is the SI amended so that committees are reproduced. And obviously we're not saying that all of the member states should be in these committees, which was the which is what DEFRA said. We're saying that we should have expert committees to make sure that we have transparent, well informed decisions being made. Um, and then something that is related to the SI, but it's not actually in the SI, is the budget and capacity issues. Um, so the, the UK government has confirmed that the HSE is going to be the competent authority, and they've estimated that it will need a budget of about £13 million a year, with an addition of 35 to 40 extra staff. We don't think that that's sufficient, given the fact that the UK is going to have to regulate just about as many chemicals as the EU does. Um, but the EU budget for the past 10 years has been 100 million euros for year, for, per year, and they have 600 statutory members of staff. So I think that the UK is going to be attempting to replicate the EU system at a cut rate price, and that's going to be damaging to the environment and human health. Jules. Yeah, I, I have a concern about divergence as time goes on. I don't think it's something that will happen um, in the very short term. Um, but I think uh, if we do separate, then um, the situation that Michael was describing where um, validations and testing and so forth that goes on uh, in, in the European chemical scene will be um, diverging from what we're doing here in the UK and you will get difference in standards building up, which will then be a barrier. And the only, the only other way it could go is for the UK to follow completely everything that is happening in Europe, but without having any influence on it. Whereas at the moment, we have quite a bit of influence on um, chemical legislation as far as European uh, directives is, is concerned. So I have a concern in the, lo in the medium and longer term about a divergence occurring, should we separate? And, and so um, we've heard concerns about the piece of the SSI, SI being incomplete. But uh, Mr Shields, what are your views on the readiness and capacity of the health and safety executive uh, to deliver on a UK reach in the case of a no deal. I think Libby Peake makes it quite clear that she has huge concerns. Do you share those concerns? I do have, I do have large concerns um, because um, I think I'm very concerned about it. Two, two IT systems, one being duplicated from the other, and it's a very complicated si system that's been built up over a, over a decade. Um, and I, I have concern that... Um, it will be very difficult for the HSC uh, from, from day one to be up and running and doing everything in a seamless, bumpless way um, l like we have now. So I, I'm, I'm not completely concerned. I'm, I'm not uh, completely convinced that the HSC is entirely ready for this. And um, I was hoping actually the memorandum of understanding that was mentioned earlier might sh shed a bit of light on this. And again, I would encourage the the committee to talk to the cabinet secretaries about how, how ready is the HSE really in terms of handling a no-deal Brexit on day one. But, I mean, we have reassurances from our cabinet secretary. Uh, we had the HSE here uh, as well, uh, assuring us that they were ready uh, some time ago. Uh, your concern seems to be a question of functionality and computers being able to like talk to, to each other. It's not a, a, about a lack of awareness of the problems or no. an ability to deal with them. Um, it's not about that. It's, it's about the, whether or not the computers can talk to each other. Is that yeah, I would agree. It's not just the computers, but the whole system and how it operates uh -huh. as, a, as a process. Um, <clears throat> I, I have no doubt that everyone is very well aware of the, the concern and uh, will do their best to deal with it. But <clears throat> I, I haven't seen a... a evidence of a rigorous risk analysis having been undertaken with real substantial evidence that, um, that the HSE and the authorities are ready for this in a, no, in a no deal situation. And that's what I would encourage you to, to try and uh, probe on the 30th of April. Are there, are there, oh, Sylvia, Sylvia, <coughs> yes, from <coughs> our side, we also agree that uh, it's unclear how decisions on chemicals uh, will be made in UK post Brexit, and uh, you know whilst these uh, scientific comi committees uh, uh, won't be um, using UK, uh, we believe still that you know aspects such as transparency 
uh, independency and the range of uh, expertise and stakeholder engagement will uh, be necessarily as part of the decision making process. So we would welcome more clarity going forward on this point. Um, then another concern is, of course, about cost uh, of compliance uh, with the future UK um, regulations. And one aspect uh, is in relation to fees. Uh, with the um, statutory instruments, we are going to uh, convert uh, EU fee uh, regulation into uh, the UK legislation. So fees are just going to be transposed into uh, UK law and do not reflect uh, uh, the, the market side. So this is one of the concerns that has been uh, raised within CIA recently. Can I just ask a question now about business preparing for potential change from EU reach to a UK system? Are there particular challenges for certain businesses, for example, SMEs? Are they less well prepared than perhaps multinationals? Yeah. Tom Shields. Yes, is the answer. I think um, SMEs are, are not well prepared. Um, I think there, are, there has been plenty of preparation provided in terms of workshops and awareness sessions, the Scottish government agencies, Scottish Enterprise and SDI, have been running events for SMEs. Um, there's a website and there's a campaign running about being ready for Brexit. Um, but the fact is that you know we've got hundreds of SMEs in the chemical sector. Um, they're usually very small companies um, and being run by a few talented individu individuals who are really busy. Um, they're all aware of this issue, but the pressure of running a small business and surviving and prospering um, takes precedent because it's more urgent. And uh, I'm, I'm quite concerned that SMEs in particular, which are a large part of our, our sector in chemicals, um, are not well prepared for a hard Brexit. Well, the question has to be then, uh, how would that lack of preparedness manifest itself? Or what are the risks to us as population or other risks or the risk I'm concerned about is that SMEs go out of business um, fairly quickly because they're unprepared um, they're depending on a supply chain that uh, delays or interrupts or doesn't deliver in the time scale they need and if you're running a small business that's on a very tight cash flow it's very easy to become insolvent very quickly and so my concern is about um, the success of these businesses in that situation. Okay. 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 Uh, well, I'm concerned. Are these businesses aware of this risk to their yes, own I'm operations? Well. Apparently, you're saying they're not, or they'll be doing something about it. So what's to be done about that, to just go on a bit further through this? I mean, we don't want to see companies I going out of I would encourage uh, the campaign on Brexit readiness to continue. and. Um, the, the, the real message is we, we don't want a hard Brexit. We don't want to get into the situation where um, we do his, have this scale of disruption to the supply chain. OK. We move on to questions from Frank Carson. Uh, thank you. E earlier in the session, we heard that uh, Libby Peake had issues with uh, the common framework and how that was progressing in regards to waste. So can I ask the stakeholders... Uh, what your views on uh, the process in developing a common framework uh, across the UK and, and what would that framework need to deliver? Sylvia, did you? So, uh, we would prefer to see no divergence between uh, uh, the devolved administration and reach and uh, chemical uh, regulations in general because uh, you know divergence has the potential to fragment the UK internal market and make compliance more challenges uh, challenging for uh, for companies so in our view decision should be UK wide uh, as much as possible to avoid trade barriers and today chemical regulations operate on UK wide basis and we would hope to see the same to continue in future. Would anyone else like to come in? Um, Michael, conscious yes, of Yes, I mean, I think line. to some extent this is, this sh it is an issue because chemicals is so centralised in the EU 
<clears throat> and that was deliberate because that was viewed as the best way to do it. And it did mean that, you know, individual member states could do less by themselves. That we have now a situation in the UK where, yeah, on the one hand, you can argue for UK centralisation and say you can't do anything in, in Scotland, for example. But then you have the issue that Scotland is already has more commitment to um, continued alignment with EU environmental law than is the case at UK level at the moment, where it's much more confused. So there are, you know, you can make strong arguments for the idea that, well, actually, Scotland, if Scotland wants to carry on being aligned with um, the EU laws, then maybe it should be able to. But it, it, you know, clearly this does disrupt markets. But I think you come into some of the fundamental issues around Brexit and the, what is it that the UK is trying to do on environmental policy. This is an important environmental policy. If the UK doesn't want to follow EU um, developments in this area, what's the rationale for that? And if Scotland does want to follow those things, why should it not be able to? So I, I think... The problem is that you end up getting into very big issues about how environment policy is dealt with in general. And obviously, Scotland does have a lot of powers in that area. So I don't think there's a simple answer to it, um, but it is going to be a big challenge. Because I, I would disagree with panelists saying that the, there wouldn't be divergence quite fast. I mean, because there are so many decisions being made. I mean, I've heard a speaker from the health and safety executive saying he would expect divergence to happen quite fast. So I think this issue about whether the UK pledges to do um, the same controls, the safe, same safety measures as the EU, or whether it diverges, and then whether Scotland agrees with that, is is really fundamental. Okay. Finn, do you want to... Uh, uh, Tom Shields. Common framework, and uh, I think the chemical industry would want to see a common UK framework for dealing with these issues and to see it as integrated as possible. I understand that there are some issues, and there's a letter from uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary about devolution and the uh, you know, apparent inconsistencies of the discussion so far on that, but we really need to get that framework resolved and have it common so that we actually do have a, a seamless uh, a move forward as we possibly can in the, in the UK. Presumably maintaining the standards that already exist and the Absolutely. protocols that exist with their reach. Yes, we wish to be common with reach as much as is humanly possible. Yeah. Finn, you? Oh, Stuart great. Stevenson? Um, just briefly, I'm interested, uh, is engagement on the development of the common framework uh, taking place or is like in waste silence more obvious? I'm getting shaking heads, Convener, I think that's the answer. Um, I've really, we've not been involved in any significant engagement on a common framework and uh, pretty much in the dark on that issue. Janice Milner, yes, um, what's your position? Concerned, we haven't been involved in development. We've been focusing very much on building the existing relationships that we have with the environment agencies because under um, the uh, UK Chemicals Agency, Health and Safety Executive, we, they, they are required to take CEPA's advice on board, but we do that through the Environment Agency. So we have good working relationships, but we need to enhance them even more. So our focus is on being on that further collaboration rather than focusing on the frameworks. However, obviously, if the Scottish Government asks for a technical input as a regulator, we would, we would do that. Um, John Scott, are you anxious to come in? Mr Shields, a very quick technical point. Is the, the deal as... Um, proposed by Mrs May, would that cover the REACH arrangements? Would that allow the REACH arrangements to continue um, uh, if it were to be passed? Yes, I, I understand that it would on day one. Um, there's still the concern about divergence in the longer term, in my view. Um, Avoid the immediate yes. um, concerns if it were to be accepted. Yes, uh, Libby so. Peake wants you to come in. Um, the, the REIT regime would have to be part of the future relationship agreement. So it's not something that's explicitly addressed in May's deal. It's something that would have to be agreed and the UK would have to negotiate access to the REIT regime if it wanted to continue it. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, just, just to be clear, this is all really not about the deal. It's about the transition period, is it not? And therefore, it's and I haven't got it in front of me, the political agreement. 
is where this will be dealt with, not in the deal. That's correct, yes. Thank you. Right, That's move correct. On. And the political agreement includes the UK's desire to have a relationship, but it makes no commitments on the EU side. Okay, thank you. Right, move on to questions from Mark Ruskell. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted just to briefly follow up on, on the point from CEPA, though, convener, and it was about stakeholder engagement. I'm just wondering in terms of CEPA's role here, you know, there's a concern that stakeholder engagement is being lost from the current regime. I mean, is there a way that CEPA could facilitate some of that in, in Scotland, actually bring together a lot of the NGOs and unions and those who've got an interest in this area to, to facilitate a view which then you feed into the HSE? If that was something that um, officials wanted us to do, then yes, we could we could take that on board. We have been discussing under our contingency planning, um, encouraging businesses to come and speak to us if they if they see challenges. We're quite clear that um, we expect a high level of environmental performance. <coughs> we also feed our expertise into the Environment Agency's Chemical Assessment Unit to help them provide advice to the Health and Safety Executive. So we do have mechanisms by which we can engage. As I say, if this was something that what you wished us to do, yes, we would, we would look at that. Useful. Um, so can I just move on to then governance then? Um, EU governance gap. Uh, could you just outline what the functions are of the EU in relation to um, policy and regulation, what those gaps might be following exit? So what, what, are, what are the sort of main things that you're concerned that we, that we lose here? Cole, want to come in first, since we have a bit of silence? It's all about reach and the, uh, the trading relationship and uh, ensuring that we can continue our, uh, our exports and imports um, without disruption. That's really the main aim as far as I'm concerned. There are a couple of other legislative things around persistent pollutants and mercury and so forth that was mentioned in some of the paperwork. There's a small involvement uh, or a smaller involvement in in Scotland in, in those particular business sector, business areas, maybe only a, a small number of companies involved, but REACH covers everyone. So it's really the policy associated with REACH that is the priority as yeah. far as we're concerned. Okay. The, there are also a number of other chemical related regimes which are not part of REACH, but where, you know, if REACH says this chemical is a carcinogen, um, then they are influenced. So there's, there's regimes on cosmetics, uh, there's some stuff on chemicals in toys, there's water framework directive on water pollution, um, there's laws on industrial accidents as well as industrial emissions. Um, so there's quite, a, you know, it isn't just about reach. Reach is in some ways the most straightforward indicator of the problem, but we are dealing with quite a wide range of other laws that are relating to chemicals. Um, and they have different you know, different issues attached to them. But the EU has, in DG Environment, in the Environment Department, in DG Grow in the Commission, and also in DG Health in the European Commission, there are quite a lot of people working on different aspects of chemicals and pollution. Um, so all these um, processes, the policies, are also important. So it is actually quite a lot more complicated than just reach by itself. Okay. Let me peek. Just say that it, the, the general concerns I have about governance remain, but with REACH in particular, I think there's uh, some additional concerns just in terms of the capacity and expertise that will be required if the UK all of a sudden has to start assessing the safety information and safety dossiers on its own. And, and we've, we've largely lost a lot of the... Um, institutional memory that was around when when HSE was involved with setting up REACH in the first instance. And, and they're obviously they're recruiting some people to, to take over these functions, but we don't think that the level of staffing is going to be adequate to the task that needs to be administered. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about wider governance issues? I mean, ECJ was mentioned um, previously. Uh, uh, do those concerns arise in relation to, <laughs> to chemicals as well? Would anyone like to answer that? I would say that yes. The What we'll do is we'll take Michael first and then Tom if you want to come in. Michael, go ahead. Sorry, uh, you've got how, you're the regulatory system and then you have how it's enforced. So, um, as we mentioned, you know, there's a lack of enforcement now of chemicals in products coming into the country. 
Um, but the whole enforcement of the system, you know, whether there is a body that can actually tell the government that you're not implementing the system properly, all these issues uh, cover chemicals in a big way as well. If we don't have something like the ECJ uh, and indeed the Commission sitting there, so it's, all these, the, the, the biggest worry I would have is you end up with a system in the UK which looks like it's doing something but in reality it's just not doing much you know you haven't got that many staff you've got thousands of thousands of chemicals they're mainly involved with talking to industry about these grandfathering registration procedures and they're not actually doing much in the terms of controlling chemicals and um, so legally you can say oh well they're carrying out their ba the basic function but they're not actually operating in line with what the law is supposed to achieve. And that's the sort of thing that maybe a court process or a Uber regulator could deal with, because otherwise you just end up with a system that's essentially empty. Okay. Tom Shields? Yeah, the, the only thing I was going to raise uh, in terms of wider governance issues is our participation in the EU ETS trading system. This is about greenhouse gases and uh, the, the taxes and... Uh, uh, regulations associated with that. We currently um, generate quite a lot of power within the industry um, and uh, we're part of that EU ETS trading system and if we separate then how do we uh, proceed in, in that particular area. Um, I, would, I would say that the EU ETS trading system only applies to some parts of, of industry so it, uh, it applies to uh, the process industry and the energy generation industry but not things like transport and agriculture who are also large emitters but they aren't part of that system so uh, we'd be concerned about what governance we're going to have around those that particular area and, and greenhouse gas emissions. Claudia yeah, Beamish. Thank you convener. Uh, could, I, could I just um, continue the line of questioning that, um, uh, that Mark has started and ask you if you think that these issues um, about environmental governance and principles have been picked up by the Scottish Government consultation um, on, on principles and governance and what you would like to see specifically here in Scotland in relation to um, monitoring or enforcement or courts, if you have any views at this stage, as it relates to your industry particularly, but more widely as well. Tom Shields? I think we'd just like to have more visibility of what's likely to happen, and um, we're not really getting that. It's, it's pretty difficult to see where, where we're going to go in a number of areas that when, we, when we separate you know, what, what the future would hold and whether you know, there would be um, tighter governance and uh, more restriction, whether we would have more influence than, than we do in the EU. It's just not clear um, at this point in time, and it would be helpful if we could have a framework with, that would, would help us see that coming. Are you able to feed into the consultation, Scottish yes. Government consultation on this and, and um, uh, being an optimist, hopefully this will clarify yes, things. We, when yes, we is, are, but I, I yeah. see no clarity about what the outcome might be. Right. right. Are yeah. there others? Who, Sylvia? Yeah. Just to add that uh, CAE will be making a response to the consultation in due course and uh, CAE advocates for continued uh, join-up approach between the devolved administrations uh, in respect to up upholding environment law. And on governance, uh, we have already expressed support in principle for uh, an oversight body in England to ensure environment protection is uh, upheld. And uh, we would urge that this body, being a public body, is given autonomy uh, to openly provide views, whether it be negative or positive, so it can be truly effective in uh, up upholding environment law. And also in our view, con um, consideration should be given whether uh, uh, one oversight body for the UK would be more appropriate in terms of resources and uh, decisions making, and thereby providing more effective uh, environment protection. But we will uh, share our views in more detail uh, through the consultation. Anyone else wants to come in? Libby? briefly say that um, so it seems quite open-ended the the consultation and there has not yet been a firm commitment to to replicate the the watchdog and government governance functions that are administered at an eu level and so we'd absolutely like to see some concrete proposals on on how that will be replaced in scotland and the rest of the uk okay Claudia, are you happy with that? Can we move on yeah, to the final I, I, I area so, question yeah. thank you very much and now to um angus mcdonald 
Okay, thanks. Um, Convener, if I could turn to uh, funding and other EU support structures. Um, our committee consideration of the REACH SI first highlighted to us the uh, significance of uh, a centralised ECHA databases and, and registration systems. Um, and we also know that uh, the ECHA, um, I think it was mentioned by Libby earlier, has a, a management committee and, and numerous technical committees uh, with stakeholders from industry, NGOs and, and trade unions permitted to, to, to participate in these meetings. But now, um, what other uh, EU support functions are important for uh, chemicals regulation and, and how can they be maintained or replicated after EU exit? Would anyone like to take that first? So, so there is one other um, agency, uh, which is the European Environment Agency, which does have members outside the EU. We currently have no clear position on whether the UK government would wish to stay in it, I think. Um, but the European Environment Agency does do studies uh, and reports on chemical issues. So it is part of the general debate on chemicals policy and the general finding of information. So that's another quite an important agency. Tom Shields. There are a number of um, inputs that we make to European committees um, involved in creating directives that are about the manufacture of equipment and uh, processes. Um, and although that doesn't directly, uh, not directly an environmental thing, it does affect environment where you're running process equipment, for, a, for example. So we'd like to think and understand about where we go to in terms of our input um, to that kind of issue going forward. Do we go back to you know, UK standards or do we continue to participate in a, in, in a Europe-wide, uh, in, more international approach? Clearly we'd like to do the latter, but um, again, that's another area that isn't entirely clear yet. Okay, thanks. Um, with, moving on to uh, funding streams um, with regard to uh, the chemical sector, c could you give us an idea of how, the, the, how might chemicals research and innovation in Scotland be impacted? Um, I mentioned in the previous, to the previous panel the issue of Horizon 2020 uh, and the new Horizon Europe uh, uh, that's, that's planned. Um, and I also mentioned when we were speaking with the Norwegian direct, uh, directorate in, in Brussels, they, they had tapped into Horizon 2020 quite successfully. So if we have, for example, a, a Norway model, would you see us tapping into Horizon Europe uh, as successfully as the Norwegians do? Tom Shields? Well, Aspire to that. Um, Scotland has benefited enormously over uh, its, its membership as part of the UK in the EU from um, things like Horizon 20 and, and a number of, of others. <clears throat> um, a lot of uh, development in the process industry and in the energy industry has come through that. It has helped to drive academic innovation in our universities and, has, and is a mainstay of, of how they go forward in terms of their thinking about funding. So, you know, this is one of the areas where I think we're, we're really concerned that we can tap in in the future and some sort of, I mean, the Norway type of deal, the Scandinavian countries in general have, have been very effective at ensuring that small countries have been able to get um, funding for their innovation and research. And we want to be in that sort of situation where we can still tap into those uh, European funding areas. As, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about um, our competitiveness when we're putting in funding bids. Um, there's already some signs that show that we're, we're being kind of uh, disadvantaged by the fact that there is all the uncert uncertainty around about Brexit. So um, it's an area that's really important for our academic development in the sector. And uh, we must really get to the point where we can still access those international funds. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. I uh, want to thank the panel for all their time this morning. Thank you very much for all the evidence that you've given us. Um, I'll just 
give some uh, information about future, future meetings. Um, and that concludes our, our session in public today. The next meeting on the 30th of April, the committee will hear from the Cabinet Secretaries for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations on EU exit and the environment. And the committee will also consider the Carbon Accounting Scheme Amendment Regulations 2019 and the Loch Carran Marine Conservation Order 2019. And as previously agreed, the committee will now move into private session and I request that the public gallery be vacated. Thank you very much.